Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to another Facebook Live rendition of Creative Badassery Show and Tell with Magic Rhino Creative. I'm Dallas Fort Worth's very own local legend, TM Rhino, and I'll be your host until one of us calls it quits. For more art and other foolish nonsense, find me on the web at www.magicrhinocreative.com or at instagram.com forward slash t.m.rhino. The URLs are in the description. So, um, yesterday I was on Facebook Live, I'd done my first post, and it was, uh, you know, pretty much horrible as far as I could tell. Uh, I'm new at this, you're going to have to cut me some slack. This is all kind of brand new to me. Um, but what I wanted to extrapolate out of that video was uh, some of the, the, uh, the basic techniques that uh, I had talked about, but I know you didn't really get a chance to see because the uh, the camera was far away I was trying to capture the whole setting you know the painting setup the different kinds of paints everything that was on my table but um, what I wanted to go over today was uh, some of the basic techniques uh, you know flat wash uh, gradient washes gradient in a color layering things like that and I want to go over some of the basic materials that I use on a regular basis in case you're interested in trying a new technique or trying along at home if you already kind of employ something similar and are struggling or whatever. Uh, so let's get started. Um, what I've got in my tray are just two uh, colors out of the tube. We've got soft body acrylics from Liquitex here. This is uh, Vivid Lime Green. And according to the label on the back, this is uh, medium viscosity, soft body, and it is opaque. This one here, uh, this is the Cheapy brand, uh, Craft Smart. I don't know where I got this from. Uh, Michaels would be my guess. Doesn't give you a whole lot of information on the back. Um, I got nothing on this. The, the, the reason why I'm even using these is to kind of demonstrate the, uh, the difference between the two. Yesterday, what I had talked about was um, how they perform different and some of the... Um, some of the like performance qualities you get or don't get uh, in the you know in the better grade paints or the lesser grade paints and um, okay so what, what I'm doing now is just making a kind of a wash mixture I'm not really um, aiming for a specific you know viscosity here I'm just I'm, what I'm just trying to do is add enough water to make a decent you know to, to make it flow I don't know if you can see that um, you know, kind of soupy, not too thick, you know, easily slides off the brush. And uh, what I've done here is set up on a piece of scrap illustration board, just some squares and some circles, and uh, I'm just going to start painting and kind of talk about what happens here. So um, first, let's just start with the flat wash. And before I do that, let me kind of recap again the brushes that I use in, in case uh, it was kind of muffled or whatever. Most of the time, I'm using round brushes. This is here is a, a Royal Taclon number five from Royal Langnickel, and uh, I believe it came out of one of the. Did it come out of one of these? I believe it came out of one of those packs I, I talked about yesterday. The TK A. I bought these packs at uh, five below for a dollar twenty-five for a pack of three in their craft section. I haven't seen them there recently. I don't know if it's a come and go type of thing, if it was a one, uh, one shot deal. I picked up three or four of them while I was there because they were cheap enough. I figured I'd give it a go. I know Royal Lang Nickel makes pretty reliable stuff as far as like you know lower end craft brushes go. Yesterday I talked about these, these folk art brushes. These have actually held up really, really well um, in terms of in terms of like like uh, longevity, you know. Uh, I, when I cracked open this this pack, I took out one brush and I've used it for two paintings and it's on my table somewhere. It's Now it's starting to get a little bit dull and a little bit frayed. Um, but, you know, overall I think their performance holds up. I think this was, you know, three to five bucks, I don't remember. Most of the time it's gold Taclon. It can be white Taclon, it doesn't really matter. Um, Here's a, a round number 10 from uh, Plaid. Those ones did pretty well. 
Um, a lot of these you can find in the in the craft section at um, Hobby Lobby's got, you know, they've got their like artist section with all the high end fancy brushes, and then they've got the you know the 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 craft paint section that's got all, all these kind of like you know dollar to two dollar uh, two fluid ounce bottles, and there's usually a bunch of them on the wall right there. And that's where I find uh, my brushes when I go to Hobby Lobby. I've also had quite a bit of success with these Royal Crafters Choice. This definitely came from Hobby Lobby. And I think it was like a pack of three, pack of five. Um, again, gold tackle on these ones. You know, you know, the benefit of these is it's got that little rubber grip. I don't know if, you know, you've got like carpal tunnel, your fingers hurt, you can't hold on the little things. These definitely help. Um, these brushes here are... The ones I use kind of exclusively when I was really um, kind of learning my craft. Uh, not because there was any particular reason, it's just those are the ones that I had and those are the ones I've kind of grown partial to. If you ever see my business card, I'm holding a paintbrush in it and it's got like kind of fire out of the tip and it's one of these. Alright, so, oh, one more thing before we get going here, let me just... Um, show you the difference in illustration board um, these are both crescent this thinner one is 215 this is what I was uh, referring to yesterday when I told you I bought a bunch of stock that was the wrong thickness I don't know if you can see that but this one is thinner than that one this is 18 ply this is 24 ply if you're going to start down the path of using acrylics on illustration board I suggest going for the 24 ply this is uh, Crescent 205 <laughs> heavyweight this was a 20 by 30 board this is just a scrap left over I'm gonna be um, you know kind of using this here and there throughout the night this thinner stuff will work if you end up loading you know heavy washes on there it has a tendency to like warp and buckle, especially if you haven't stretched it or mounted it. Like, um, like for example, this one here, I'm just kind of using it freehand. It's it's not very big, so it's not gonna have uh, a high tendency to want to warp or buckle. The bigger the sheet is, the more likely it is to happen, especially um, the more water that's in your paint. So. What I kind of wanted to demonstrate, like I don't know, what I get from a lot of people is, you know, how do you make all your paintings with simple little tiny brushes? How do you do that? <clears throat> and so, I wanted to give you a demonstration of how it's done. We're going to start with just doing a flat wash. Now if you'll pardon me, I've got my adult beverage for the night. I know yesterday towards the end of the live feed I started slurring and mumbling to a degree. I think it was like 2 in the morning. And that's when I realized I was pretty much out of shape for the day. Hopefully that won't happen, but if I do start slurring again, uh, blame Corona. It's their fault. Alright, so here we go. Now I'm going to hold this up. Like I said yesterday, when I paint, I rarely, if ever, paint on the table because... I need gravity to work with the wash. Now here I am just kind of mixing this up. It's a little bit soupy. And I don't know if you see that brush. It's heavily loaded. It's starting to drip right off the brush. That's what I'm looking for when I'm trying to cover a large enough area. And so I'm just going to start. And yesterday I was referring to a technique called chasing the puddle. And this is exactly what it is. As I start to paint and move the paint down, you'll see that puddle start to form. And I'm just going to add paint to it and drag it down. And hopefully this gives you a better, um, a clearer example of what it is I was referring to yesterday. Because I know I was really far away. You couldn't really see it. And not only that, I didn't really do a chasing the puddle technique. This is what you got to be careful for. You definitely don't want to oversaturate it so that it runs on you. You definitely want to keep it in control to the best of your ability. I'm going to add paint and smooth it out. 
kind of level, level it out. Now th this is the exact same technique that watercolors, uh, watercolor artists use. It is no different. The only difference is that the setup time in this paint is much, much quicker. So you, you've got to definitely think beforehand what your what the move is. What are you going to do? Now these are easy because they're just simple rectangular shapes or square shapes. There's not a lot of like crazy nooks, you know, ins and outs of different shapes or, or, or different like, you know, inlets and outlets that I got to contend with. But for this technique, I figured just, you know, since, since I'm going to demonstrate the flat wash, why not just use a simple shape? Now, here's what we're going to do. Um, this is also what, uh, oh, there we go. Um, what our, uh, watercolor artists will do is when you get to the bottom of a shape, you're going to have this big puddle. And you got to do something with it. You can't just leave it there because you're going to end up with a with a, uh, a difference in paint density and value. It's going to change, you know, it's going to change. Let me see if I can do this here extended. See how I'm just gracing that line? Now see that puddle? You can't see this because it's off camera, but I got on my dag nasty pants again. And I'm just wiping the brush, getting all the paint off. Now that it's dry, if I touch it and pick it up, I can start to remove some of that paint. And as long as it's still wet, it'll even out to some degree. What you want to be careful for is like things like this. It is a little bit difficult. Once it starts to set up, you don't want to touch it too, too much. However, the, um, the benefit of working in layers is that even if there is a little bit of discrepancy in there, just a little bit, the next layer will more than likely even it out. See that? Pretty flat. I'm going to speed up the drying time tonight. You're going to have to ignore this noise. It might be a little loud because my phone is right next to my working area. Now keep in mind that this was also done with a, what do I say, a, a five round. I could have used a six or an eight or, you know, a ten or whatever. The reason why I like using smaller brushes is, um, a smaller brush as possible anyways, is because when you get into tight corners like that, it becomes a little bit difficult to control it with uh, a brush that, you know, if you are if you have a good steady hand, it can be done. My hand is not that steady. Um, I shake quite a bit, and I oftentimes go over, so I prefer, I prefer to get a brush that'll get up in that corner. I missed a little bit right there and right there, but that's okay, because we're gonna hit this with a second wash. And when I do that, I want you to pay attention to what happens to this one. I'm gonna start here this time. So what we're going to have is a single layer of wash and a double layer of wash. And I want you to pay attention to what happens to, you know, to, to the look and the overall evenness of that after the second layer. And I'm going to do the same exact thing. I'm just going to go this way. When mixing your paints, I don't know if you can see that. I didn't do a thorough enough job. I was kind of in a rush to get this ball rolling with today's demonstration. But you definitely want to mix it thoroughly so that you don't have clumps in there. Because clumps are hard to get out, um, you know, when you're painting. And uh, if you don't notice it and it gets stuck in there, it's in there permanently. You can try to dig it out with uh, the edge of an X-Acto knife. But that's oftentimes ill-advised if you start marring the surface of your board you're going to create problems. Now, you can kind of see, oops, see there's one right there. You can kind of see, this is hard because I'm trying to hold it and I'm shaking and my hands aren't very steady. Not on a little tiny piece of board. The trick to this is not to let any of the edges start to completely set up. Where it's wet right there, 
it will start to set up if you wait too long. And I'm going to rotate this one here. <clears throat> if you wait too long, even though the edge is wet, it will start to set up just a little bit. And then if you move it, you'll kind of see a line there. It happens most um, with uh, transparent paints because those are dye based and not necessarily pigment and the dye acts a little bit different than the pigment does. Alright, so we're getting down to where the first application of paint was. I'm going to try to smooth this out as much as I can. Now the first application of paint wasn't all that bad. It was relatively even. This was um, the soft body paint that I had picked up while I was in Japan. I know that they do sell soft body paints uh, mostly online. I think uh, locally Azel Art might have some but when I started getting into painting none of the art stores had them. Even though I had heard, you know, they had like um, the fluid liquid acrylics and all that. And those are also suitable to use. But I wanted something that kind of had the versatility of being used uh, in a wash type scenario. Or if I wanted to be a little thicker for canvas. Like I bought a lot of these paints back in the day of, of my art school because we were doing, um, I had an acrylic painting class. And we actually painted on uh, canvas or on primed masonite or something like that. Something that was like heavy bodied, you know, like not, not, it didn't soak up the paint the same way that illustration board does. So you can see a bunch of those little speckles. No, here's how you get them out, folks. Before it's too late, gently touch it with the tip of your brush. If you can, try to lift it out. And wipe it on a clean rag. I'm using my dag nasty pants. Because like I said yesterday, it's just quicker, it's just easier. You can see that there. Then you know around reaching overhead for um a, a paper towel. Now in a situation like this where the paint is coming right off the board. I don't really have to worry so much about other ones, damn things. I don't have to worry so much about um, scooping up the paint so much as I do just getting it off the edge. That's why I'll give that a quick drying. Now, in my, uh, in my best guess, well, not my best guess, my educated guess, I would say, you can use, like, you know, a lot of people, when they do straight lines, they want to mask things. So I'm going to give you a de little demonstration on masking. This is uh, 3M's Magic Tape, and it works wonders for some things. In this type of situation, it's probably not going to be the best uh, approach, and I'll show you why. This stuff is um, low tack, but it forms a really decent seal. I do use it as like frisketing edge for a lot of the airbrush work that I do because I can just, you know, as long as it's relatively straight, I can use this stuff instead of the high end frisket. It gives me just as good of a a seal um, it's relatively inexpensive it's easy to come by but um, let me show you why this is probably not the best way to approach something with that's that's very fluid uh, I'm gonna use this uh, be what do we got a royal crafters choice number 10 and it was neglected and had a bunch of paint on it it's kind of blunted that's not uh, that big a deal so here we go. Here's here's my tape. Can you see it right there? There's the tape. And uh, let me whip up some more green quickly before I run out because I'm going to. 
uh, again, I'm using my egg coddler palette. I find this incredibly handy. I can mix my colors in there. I can put my all my um, fresh out of the tube colors up there. I can do my mixing in palette, and I still got a little reserve left in case I need to make adjustments. Whoop! Guess what? It's getting muddy because there was some right on there. All right. <laughs> We're just going to let that ride. We're going to deal with it. All right, so a slight hue shift, but that's okay. The, um, the technique and the principles still apply. So, again, I got my magic tape. We're going to say that's, um, that's going to be our frisket. And we put it there for a clean line. Now, because the shape is bigger... This would be a really good time to use a bigger brush, right? Right, we gotta use the right tool for the for the right job. Ah, I gotta slow that run down. And this is where it gets a little dicey because the bigger brushes, when it gets kind of blunted like that, does not have the um, the sharpness that's needed to kind of coast along. Here's an old carpenter's trick. If you need a straight line, if you have an edge to use your finger as a guide as. We used to do this in carpentry when I was, when I had to, you know, if I shave a quarter inch or shave an eighth of an inch off, mark off a quarter or an eighth and run your finger up and down the guide, the edge of the board. There's a big old glob. Get the hell out of there. And we're almost done. Okay. So I'm just going to go quick. I'm going to be careful down here because I know I'm running out of the the masking. Now, oop, see that? I missed the spot. It's not too late to fix it. This was... Oh, dude, it's getting all over the place. <laughs> This wash, uh, because it was a kind of a applied kind of like, kind of hasty, you know, like really watery, you can see the runs in it. That's another detriment of working like that. But this is just an example of. Well, it might not be the best idea to use masking. On your edges. Most of the stuff I do is painted freehand. A very large majority of it. Because, um, what it can be, it's, it's usually the stuff that I'm working on is just a series of flat washes or wash gradients or something like that. I'm going to show you that next. The, uh, like a, of how to get a of a gradient wash right now let's just check this like I said this stuff comes off pretty easily oh look at that it wasn't that bad I must have pressed it down usually what happens is it doesn't form a perfect seal along the edge and if water gets under there it starts to run and exploit the, the adhesive and starts to pull up I guess that's probably not the best example uh, of that happening because that actually came out relatively clean. Uh, I'm not going to bother to do it again. But just a word to the wise. If that's going to be your approach and you're going to get runs under there, you're going to have to deal with them later. Uh, so, alright, so that's basically just the, the flat wash approach. Here's three layers, two layers, one layer, and you can definitely see. Um, you know, the washed outness, the, the, the white of the board coming through, it's coming through less, it's coming through even less. This is the importance of building up your layers uh, when dealing with, you know, watercolors or with uh, any media, really. Um, un unless you've got like an impasto painting technique where it's going all going on thick or a plain air or whatever it is. Uh, but for water media, building up layers, building up color, building up value is the way to go. Once it's on there... 
um, it's not so easy to get off. I was uh, explained that to some degree yesterday. Let me see if I can't find my eraser. Yeah, I'll find it in a minute. Right now, let's just keep going with washes. Um, so, all right, here we go. Let's use, uh, let's switch it up to the other green I had loaded. The uh, Craft Smart, I don't know, grass green is what they're going to call it. This is the, um, uh, the, the, what do you call it? The, like the cheaper grade paint. And I was talking about that yesterday. You can definitely use these paints. They don't perform quite the same. You know, it's, it's like, it's like driving somewhere on a car. You can take the Ford Fiesta or you can take the Lamborghini. They're both going to get you there. It's just a matter of like how fast and how nice the ride is, right? It's kind of the same with, um, with lesser paints. They will perform just not as good. But I learned to paint with um, some of the lesser paints, and so I'm kind of used to it. But I've also, um, you know, now that I've kind of figured out how they work, I can also give it an honest comparison to the better grade paints. And, you know, realize, oh yeah, the, you know, the better grades, are, the, the, there's definitely... They definitely flow better. There's definitely more coverage. It's more even. The paint to binder ratio is, is uh, way better and therefore they, they stick. They don't lift off as much. Which, you know, can be good, can be bad. Sometimes you want to use a lift off technique. In which case, a uh, higher grade paint might actually um, hurt the overall result. <laughs> Alright, so here we go. Um, I'm going to do a, another Chasing the Puddle. And this is again another old watercolor technique where you want to make a a color to clear gradient. So now instead of loading more color, I'm just going to add, this is clear water, that's all it is. I'm going to add a couple of drops um, into the puddle. And that's going to dilute that puddle a little bit. And I'm going to move it down ever so slightly. Oops, see it's starting to set up on me. I'm going to move it down ever so slightly and I'm going to set it I'm going to let it sit there again I'm going to try to be quicker this paints obviously got uh, different setup properties than the last one did you know and in between um, adding the water and then moving it down you've got to kind of clean the brush so if there's any residual pigment on your brush it doesn't get um, you know, put into your clean water, and then put back into the into the puddle. And you can kind of see the transition happening. It's actually happening really quick because uh, I think I took too long. But that's okay because. We're going to do another layer because I can't stress that enough, the importance of layering. So I'm going to just round this one off real quick. And grab my trusty hair dryer. Oh, there's a big old puddle. Let's get the hell out of there. Get the hell out of there. Get off my lawn, you freaking kids. Now, in this case, I may not want to let that dry too, too much because having moisture in the board will actually help with the next layer uh, with, the, with the fluidity. It, you know, if your paint's not moving the way it should, you got um, really, you got a couple of options. The, the two most common that I use are to either wet the board first with clean water or you can always dilute your paint a little bit more with uh, some more water, but that's going to thin out your wash. So that's probably the wrong thing to do. Look at all that now. Um, some people might opt for, let's say, this stuff. 
Flow Aid. This was from Liquitex. There's a bunch of other manufacturers out there. And um, it's supposed to be like a uh, like a flow enhancer to kind of help um, help your pigments reach kind of a deeper stain. And if I remember correctly, the functionality of that stuff is to actually break up the the what do you, surface tension of the like the water molecules or the or the or the binder molecules. I forget which one, but it's supposed to kind of loosen stuff up. It's like adding a little bit of, you know, imagine if you could add oil to your paint like you would to your car to lube things up. It's kind of what it does. I've used it in some of my paintings, and I've never really noticed that much of a substantial benefit. And I, and I think it's because of um, the techniques and approach that I use where everything is so wet. It's like even if it breaks up the, the water tension, it's still kind of subject to... <clears throat> the absorption rate of the board and um, the texture of the board itself yeah. all right so real quick that was a wet into wet technique I'm gonna I'm gonna do one really fast let's see I got about 20 minutes left before an hour is up I know I got 90 minutes according to Facebook Live, but I think of a, an hour might be all I can handle. I'm going to crank out one of these real quick. Now, this is the um, the better grade paint, the soft body acrylics, and I'm going to try the wet and the wet technique. Yeah, let me do this first. Let me try the wet and the wet technique using this paint and see if the results are different in terms of, in terms of you know, if it's set up, if it, if it leaves a, a watermark. You know, or if the transition is smoother. In general. All right, so clear that out. Here's some clean water. Yeah, maybe in slightly unfair comparison, I'm gonna try to beef up the pigment up there just a little bit. Because it's so washed out, that might have something to do with it. But all right, real quick. So I'm kind of out of. Yeah, I got a little bit more. Let's do it again. Whoops. All right. So there's the color. And as I come down, it's it definitely seems a transition from color to clear. A little bit easier by the time I get down here it's practically no color at all transitioning up that's the difference in <laughs> you know the lesser grade versus the better grade is that you will get slightly better handling or you know much better handling in this case but there are some other factors to consider the, the amount of water per color the pigment itself a lot of things uh, come into play here so you know if I had this exact same color from Liquitex and the soft body then I could make probably a more accurate comparison but I do notice with you know the lesser grade the, the dollars the you know the dollar for two ounces two bucks for two ounces whatever it is sometimes it's even less 50 cents you do get a lot of this you get a lot of the splotchiness um, when trying to get delicate handling and that's not the end of the world if you know if you can live with it. Uh, let me see what I can find right now. All right, so let me just show you this real quick then. In these types of situations, um, yesterday I touched on the fact that I also incorporate airbrush in a lot of my pieces, and this is a very good example to kind of demonstrate um, how, but more importantly, why. Now, an airbrush is, you know, a very expensive tool I don't recommend anyone just just running out and getting one because I said they're cool and they're awesome and I can't live without it even though that happens to be the case um, there's that they you know they're definitely expensive if you want a decent airbrush setup that's gonna last you a long long time you're looking at two to three hundred dollars for the airbrush itself you're looking at four four hundred to six hundred for the compressor 
and there's definitely a learning curve involved. There's most definitely a learning curve there. You don't just pick them up and go. Um, graffiti artists will know exactly what I'm talking about because can control is probably the closest thing that I can think of to how an airbrush operates. Um, you know, and they've got all their, their special caps and they know that how distance affects the, the hard or soft edges of the lines and all that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to load this. Again, this is my very, very old Vega 1000. I talked about it yesterday. I don't even think they make it anymore. I think Vega got snatched up in a lawsuit to Thayer and Chandler. I don't know if they're still around anymore. I don't even know if I can find parts for this. Right now, this is the only one I have that's working. Um, so you can see I just loaded the cup and uh, with a paintbrush. And here is the beauty and magic of these things. Let me scooch this a little bit more into the center here. Get that out of the way. Now, I'm not going to worry about that edge. Uh, right now, I'm just using some flat cards as my masking. I'm going to give it a little, you know, give a little practice. And it's stuck. There we go. All right. That's going to spit on you. Oh, no. No, not have a paint yet. I didn't properly clean it from using it last night, so it's a little bit gummed up. But it still works. So what I'm doing is just sweeping back and forth gently, applying little paint at a time, and just like the wash technique, I'm building it up. The last thing you want to do is this, and get the spider webs or the spider legs. The reason I love airbrushes is because you can cover all manner of sin with it. Like, and you can get just the softest gradients that, um, I don't know, I, I suppose some artists can achieve it with a brush. Well, let's spit out for you. Some, some artists can achieve it with a brush. <coughs> I've never been that skilled. I don't know if you remember what it looked like, but it was kind of splotchy. You can still see a little bit of there. But the overall color shift, the transition from the dark green to the light green, is much, much softer. And um, that's why I love using an airbrush. Let me see if I can squeak this in here. This was the painting I tried to show you yesterday that I was working on. You can see airbrush right there, how soft that is. The little touch of warm, uh, warm color on her nose. All of this that was hand painted. This was hand painted, uh, let me see, up there, the halo around the sun, that kind of orangey yellow, all that airbrush, you know, because it makes that transition from the light to the middle value to the dark pretty much seamless. Something that could be done by hand, but man, it would take a long time, and I'm all about getting there as quickly as possible. As I talked about yesterday, this method even if you can do it fast still takes a lot of time like it's a lot of my paintings take months um you know now that's that's getting into the studio at nighttime only from you know say 10 p.m till 2 3 a.m but there's many many times um that i'm up for you know four to six months into the witching hours of the evening working in my studio cranking out that new piece Everyone's like, dude, why does it take you so long, you know, to... we got an art show in two weeks. What do you mean you can't have three paintings done by then? Well, hopefully this video explains a little bit of that. Now, normally when I'm doing a painting too, I always keep scrap around. It is very, very well advised to always have scrap like... I've gotten confident enough in my abilities and I kind of know how to correct for it if I go, let's say I go to make a green and I, here's my painting and I want to test it and it's the wrong green. Um, you know, you can quickly wipe away most of it. Hopefully use a, not your finger, use a paper towel, use something. Um, 
so long as you have the base coat close to accurate, it ain't that big a deal. But like, let's say, uh, let's say I want I put down this color green around this circle. You know, let's say I did this, and then I realized, oh no, I made a mistake. I've got to get that off. What I wanted was this lighter color green. What I was trying to talk about yesterday about the proximity of, you know, values is that so long as your values are kind of close and the color is kind of close, you can get away with, um, you know, you can get away with making some mistakes and no one's really going to be the wiser for this green here, you know, let's say I started putting down dark green first and then said, oh no, I want the light green. Um, a couple of things are going on. There's a, uh, first of all, this, this light green is a much lighter wash than the dark green, but there's also the huge disparity in the temperature of the color. <coughs> they're, they're not close enough that you can definitely see where something went wrong. The only thing that you can do in a situation like that is either cover this with an opaque let me see if I can do that. Um, the other problem that you're going to run into there, though, is that you're going to see... Uh, this isn't even opaque. This is a different one here. Eh, where'd it go? Let's use this one. How about that? Okay, so let's say uh, this is my situation, and I've got to remedy that. Here's another cheaper paint. It's not quite the same uh, color intensity. Hopefully it's thicker. It's part of the reason why I grabbed it. I mean, this is some kind of... I don't even know where this came from. It's just green and it was on my table. But I'm not going to dilute this with water. And I'm going to apply it pretty thick. You can remedy that by, you know, hitting it with thicker paint. This is even a good example. Because it's incredibly transparent. Oh, it's glazed. That's why. <laughs> but even if it's glaze, even though it's glaze you can kind of see now even though it's relatively transparent in nature that that first um, you know swatch of like you know cooler green right there it's becoming a little bit more obscured um, with a thicker paint application your eye will definitely pick up the. Um, yeah, oh, here we go. Your eye will definitely pick up the the difference in thickness of paint. Your eye is very sensitive to a lot of things, you know, color and value and temperature and thickness. You know, it's kind of like how the old masters used to paint when they painted fat uh, fat over lean. Because the lean paint, the thin paint, the wash paint has a tendency to visually recede when juxtaposed against a really thick application. Here's that first green. I found it on my desk there. This is supposed to be opaque. And it's getting there. I got a little water on my brush, so it's slightly thinning out. But you can see how the thicker and, you know, darker the value I make whatever color is sitting on top the less you can see that mistake underneath you can um, you can sometimes uh, hit it with a white paint and bring it back close to white so long as you're going to put enough paint back over the top to kind of conceal it because if you don't paint the entire shape you're going to see the difference in the white um, between the board and the, and, the, and the new layer, your conceal layer. If that makes any sense. What we got? Okay, 10 minutes. So, <clears throat> what do we cover here? We covered flat wash. We covered how to do a gradient, which is basically just a flat wash chasing the puddle adding a little bit of water to the puddle as we move it down ever so slightly in, uh, in increments. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit how layering the paint um, can and will obscure your pencil lines. 
Uh, when we first started out, I had these pencil lines here. They weren't incredibly dark. I used, uh, I think, just an HB or an H or something like that. But um, as you start putting on color, what you get is competing values. You get values that are getting darker, which are coming closer to that. And you're also getting, uh, let me see if I can do it here. What you got to think about is this on kind of like a, like a, on a micro level. Pretend this is the surface of your board, right? And you draw a line coming down and you're, you cut it and you're looking at the profile. So you've got this little tiny a bit of graphite sitting there. And as you do, uh, you know, wash a paint over it, what's happening is the water is evaporating. Hold on one second. The water is evaporating and all the little molecules of paint are slowly falling and some of them are covering up your pencil line. And you do another layer of paint after the first one dries and you get another layer of, uh, you know, little, little paint particles and color molecules. And you can still kind of see through them, but the more paint you stack up, the more obscured it becomes. It's just like um, looking through glass. You can look through a window, no problem, but if you, if you know, you stack up, let's say you take, you know, five inches of glass and hold it up, it's going to be hard to see through that unless it's like some kind of super special grade, like aquarium glass maybe or whatever. It's like if you take, um, if you ever take a piece of acrylic, like a, you ever, next time you're, you're messing around with one of your frames, you know, you can hold it up like this and you can look right through it, but if you try to look through that edge, even though that acrylic is supposed to be transparent, you're looking through enough material density, it's going to obscure your view. That's what happens with uh, paint applications. As you build it up, <laughs> even if the colors are transparent, you're going to get line obscurity. So sometimes what you got to do is go back over your lines and, you know, if line is a big, um, is a big feature in your artwork, you got to paint it and you got to, you got to hit your lines again. And that's not always easy. Um, these were done with a straight edge. My hand is shaking quite a bit, but you know. So I just I did just want to point that out. Now, very quickly, let's see here. Um, one last thing. Let's cover. I already kind of covered the airbrush a little bit, but I want to cover it just a little bit more. Um, what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna show you one of the techniques I use quite a bit. We're gonna pretend this is a ball, and we want to add some you know we'll say here's a, here's the highlight here's the uh, the core shadow down there will be you know some reflected light you know let's let's say here's the here's the cast shadow or whatever and because this technique relies quite a bit on um, transparency of the washes like you know you don't ever build them up to be super super opaque typically um, you can start to describe your forms and your shadows and stuff before you even get to painting. <clears throat> now, some of this will bleed through. What you got to keep in mind is that you're, you know, you're laying down kind of a gray, and it is going to affect your color as if you're mixing some gray with it. Some people do that quite often. Like I know what, when I see a lot of kind of beginning artists or amateurs they will tone down all their colors with black and it instantly becomes muddy. And it just looks kind of amateurish, you know, because that in the real world, that's not how light works. Um, light doesn't start muting itself with black the minute it starts to change. And that's why we have the whole spectrum, right? Like this, that's kind of how things work. It not only walks through the spectrum, but it walks through, um, what do you call that? Color saturation. So, uh, Okay, so here's here's often how I work. I got my outlines. Um, I've set some like a roadmap for shadows. There's a core shadow there. <coughs> I'm sorry, cast shadow. Oh, dude, something in this room is fucking me up. Jesus Christ. Um, 
So long as you know that your values are not going to exceed your pencil lines, you can be a little bit more adventurous um, with them. And by what I mean by that is because we, we because we know we have to build up our values. Don't try to hit the correct value with your pencil. Use this only as as a road map to follow. So here's our here's our object, here's our ball, there's going to be a specular light, there's going to be local color, there's going to be a core shadow color, there'll be a reflected light color and there'll be a cast shadow. But it's not going to be black, it'll be, you know, whatever. I don't want this to be as dark as the final because a lot of that pencil is going to show through. All I'm all I'm trying to do is say, here's a form, really, really, you know, soft pencil line. Here's a highlight. I'm I'm just giving myself a map to follow. That's all this is. And um, so let me do this really quick. It says I got about you know three minutes before an hour is up. And oftentimes what I'll do is just you know. Paint right over the whole shape, right? Trying my best to knock out or, you know, um, knock out the highlight. That's if I want it to be, if I want it to be like, you know, a specular hard, you know, a hard shape like that. But because these washes are very thin, um, it's not incredibly difficult to soften that up. Here's some more of those, like... Lumpy things. Get the hell out of there. Now, these are not the um, colors that I would necessarily choose uh, for, let's say, you know, I guess under the right lighting condition it could work. But, so here's what I do I let that dry. Right now we've got a faint. We've got a specular light. We know where the the form shadow is. Um, now, most of the time, these form shadows, form shadow core, I forget, former core shadows, whatever it is, they they softly roll in, right? It's not like it's not like just this solid band of hard edges. You can approach it that way. If you want to, if you're trying to do something more graphic, like, um, kind of like how you, you know, uh, minus the, uh, gradient blend to a tool in Illustrator, the old school way it used to be done by actually making shapes and, um, stepping the, the tone and the value. You can approach it that way. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wet this board. So here's one topic I didn't cover. I mean, I kind of talked about it, but wetting the board is just like, you know, when you pre-wet your paper in watercolor. When I touch the paint there, remember how when I laid this line down, it was nice and hard? Well, none of that is happening right now because the the water that's on that board is softening those edges and trying to make it move and kind of, you know, dilute in a way. It doesn't have the same doesn't have the same um, flow as what, like if you do this with watercolor, if your, pa your paper's wet and you touch it and it's just going to start spreading out and it will just keep going. <laughs> you get a little bit of that here, but it, it definitely doesn't have the same amount. That wasn't good. It doesn't have the same amount of flow. Um, it can be like this. It can be controlled around the edges because I don't know if you saw up in there the edges started to kind of um, spider crawl out and it was way less uniform than uh, its watercolor counterparts so I'm gonna speed this up I'm gonna go as quick as I can so that was a you know a full you know, kind of conventional wet in the wet painting technique. And again, because we need to, you know, work in layers, or it's at least beneficial to work in layers here, what I'm going to do is, because that uh, dirty water is actually similar to the color, I'm probably the same, similar enough in color, I don't need to wet the whole thing, I just kind of got to kind of wet the area. 
And uh, again, just touch it, touch it, touch it. Make little dots. Do your best to kind of keep them in line with uh, that core shadow I had set up with pencil. Remember when I was talking about building a road map? That's exactly what I was talking about. I gave myself something visual to follow that I know wasn't going to be too much of a distraction or an impact uh, kind of after the fact. Now here, I got a, I got a little a little edge setting up. I don't know if you can see that. It's a little tiny edge, very faint. But me being the uh, perfectionist that I am, I feel the need to get rid of that. So, all right. Now, while that's still wet, no, let's try it. I'll tell you what, let's try it one more time. So, you can see it started to run a little bit. No big deal. We're just going to level that out. I'm going to hit this with another coat of the bright green. And I'm going to just use dirty water. This is a little bit thick. Here we go. All right. Now, because we knocked out that shape, the circle right there, in the very beginning, remember what happened when we were doing the flat washes and layers? We got one layer, two layers, three layers. Because we've got that one layer already circling it, I can now go over it, and you're going to see uh, hopefully a little bit of a difference. That might be too powerful, a little bit. You can see a little. I'm going to paint the whole thing, because yesterday when I was talking about the influence of colors, the top color being the dominant one, that which lends influence. When I paint over this cooler green core shadow, they optically mix, and because they do that, they're now related, which means they're unified visually. See how that's coming along? Now, let me draw this real quick. You can see that see that puddle building up right there and that's enough of a puddle that it's going to be a problem but what I'm going to do is just move it down into here because I know that uh, once I put the cast shadow down there it's going to be dark enough to conceal that color that color is not going to have enough tinting power or value to make a difference now bear with me one second I've got to find here we go yesterday I was telling you about this little jammy right here Sanford eraser stick um, I got this at locally at Azel Arts uh, my buddy Mike Moffitt and John I don't know if John still works there but I know Mike Moffitt does he runs the show he's a cool dude um, and he's got these or he can get them if you're interested Sanford eraser stick. It's a typewriter eraser. I think it was I want to say two dollars and thirty five cents per each. They last forever um, I bought these ones For a demonstration I had done But I still had my own personal stash just like my paints from back in the day Coming up on 20 years or more than 20 years um, Now in this case we can see slightly lighter. Um, what do you call that thing? Local color, local value, turning value. This one is still needs a little bit of work, but right now I'm going to ignore that. What I want to do is show you this eraser stick. This eraser stick is very, very good for going in and um, lifting out paint but it's got to be done very delicately and not only that but this board has to be absolutely dry let me see if you can see right here it was wet and if I start to erase and there's any moisture in that board at all do you see how it gets chewed up I've done this a million times too because I touch it and it feels dry 
And as soon as I hit that eraser, it starts digging up. If you gotta erase values, if you gotta, you know, make highlights, make sure that it's dry because there's not really a cure for that. Aside from trying to scrape it off and then having to paint over it. I did that on my painting the other day. Um, okay, so anyways, here we go. I'm going to keep going. I can get a little bit more abrasive now because I know it's not going to peel up. Not only can I lighten the value, hit that specular, but I can soften the edges. Remember how I knocked out like a pretty hard circular shape? So long as I <coughs> feather the pressure harder in the center, lighter as I get out, as I, as I feather it, now I've got this kind of soft glow, but it's still green, right? Like, maybe you want it that way. Maybe you want it like that. Maybe you want it to be a little bit brighter. In which case, uh, if I can find it. That's black. That's whatever that is. Where did I put it? I guess this is the benefit of being organized. I told you I know where my no, yesterday I know my paint is on my table. I just don't know where. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna use this one. This is close enough. So, oh here, let's do this. There it goes. Now this is actually not acrylic. This is a tube of gouache I've been lugging around. Again, Holbein. Holbein. LTD made in Japan. 40, I don't know. Old. This thing is super old. Still works like new. So, here we go. You can do this with acrylic. Gouache happens just to be a little bit more effective because it's in a conventional E, an opaque medium. But now that I've got that kind of soft halo, if I want to go back in and add like a, a really bright specular white, I can do that. Can you see that? Remember when I was talking about the... Um, talking about earlier the thickness of paint if I hold it like this you can actually see the shadow being cast from, from the light I'm working under your eye will be able to detect that under most circumstances I could level that out a bit at the expense of kind of reducing the uh, the visual impact of it but it will always kind of be there <laughs> it works in these situations because uh, you know, fat over lean, fat comes forward, lean recedes, so washes recede, thicker paint will come forward. That's how the old masters painted anyways. Uh, if you look at all, most of their work, you know, maybe there's some, um, what do you call those things? Uh, some, uh, fuck, I forgot. Maybe there's some variations. Oh, look, here's another one. White gel pen also works pretty well. No, well, not today. It's not nearly as bright as the uh, as the gouache is, but it's also, you know, good substitute. What I was gonna say is maybe there's some exception to the rules as far as the old masters go. There might be some people that have uh, a totally different technique. Um, okay, and so real quick, it looks like I'm out of time. It's already been slightly over an hour. Um, I'm just going to, really quickly, all right, let's do this. Earlier when I was talking about um, people using black to muddy their colors uh, or to darken them, and I said it looks amateurish, and uh, I don't think I'm necessarily wrong in this instance. I know a lot of professional artists will agree. In my estimation, black is like the last color you should ever reach for in terms of toning down your colors. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take some of that green I had earlier, I'm going to mix it with its 
complement red uh, and it's going to start to get muddy and dirty now the thing is the trick is you know with color mixing is you've got to keep your colors relative now I know this is different it's kind of a different situation I'm just gonna say that the shadow is green right here it's a, you know a pretty decent gray gray mixture it's you know half and half a lot of people just start mixing colors and they say oh you know look at this you know I muted the green that should be good enough and what they're not realizing is this is more on the it's closer to red like it's got a red tint to it um, and so what you want to do is you definitely want to keep your colors you know relative to each other if I did it like this way I can definitely see a green tint in there it's really mute it's really dirty it's barely there but it is there and the more green I get the more like proximal to that color you know the we'll say the shadows become the, the shadow should probably be a different color it's still really muted but it doesn't look like it's red and uh, now this is wash is very thin but earlier when I was talking about making sure that your the value of your of your shadow is darker than the pencil lines you put down and this is kind of why I know this is you know a horrible ellipse there but uh, in the shadow areas sorry I got a paint brush in my mouth in the shadow areas you can uh, leave a little texture if you want to it doesn't hurt anything so long as it doesn't override the value or draw like un unwanted attention there usually things that are textured would be in the light source you know like um, textured would be in the light and things that are obscure would be in the shadows right but sometimes you can just to break up the monotony of the obscurity of shadows you can leave some pencil work in there I mean you, you can even see it uh, let me see if I can zoom in here if you look real real close you can still see some of the pencil lines, the really light ones, <laughs> in the turning edge. There's nothing wrong with that because when people are looking at it at that resolution, at that distance, none of that is uh, very obvious. Now lastly, before I sign out for the night, um, I just also want to cover one more time kind of the importance between thick versus thin paint applications because uh, they are important and they are useful I'm gonna just grab this uh, you know what do I got Americana wild orchid um, what you can do is uh, what I do in my paintings quite a bit is now that I have you know I've established this shape I've established established its form I've established its shadow um, let's say I want to put it in this purple environment oh yeah you get to watch me paint a circle too. check that out circles are not easy see how loaded that brush is it's got a pretty good glob of paint but it's very thick which I'm gonna use to my benefit and what I'm doing is putting pressure on my hand uh, this is how you stay, you know, this is how you do it. Start in a corner, kind of touch it, right? And uh, my instructor, um, Kazuhiko Sano from the Academy of Art, he's dead now, rest in peace. But he used to say, you have to learn to see with your hands. And I don't know if that was just a metaphor or if there was something that was lost in translation because he was from Japan. You know, I'd been in the U.S. a long time. But what I extrapolated out of that is you have to learn to paint with uh, muscle memory, right? Muscle memory is pretty much everything in terms of control so what I'm doing here is applying even pressure 
to this brush as I slowly drag it around, right? I'm using my pinky kind of as a as a as a stop, as a guide, and I'm paying very close attention to how hard my fingers are pushing and I'm trying to not fluctuate that at all. And here's uh, this is going to be kind of my final demonstration. I know I've gone over the hour now. That's okay. I just wanted to quickly put this green ball in an environment. Maybe very lastly, see that line. This is why I paint most of my stuff freehand, unless for some reason I absolutely need a razor sharp edge, like. Um, there was a painting I did last year, year before that, that um, had some airplanes in it. And if you know anything about aircraft, those things are meticulously designed and built. They have to be. <clears throat> so in that case, I used a lot of that magic tape and got those razor straight edges. Um, I didn't try to risk any of that by hand. So... Okay, so here we go. Here's the uh, the visual qualities of thicker paint, you know, thinner construction on your foreground element. Uh, really quickly, I'm going to say that the bounce light onto this ball is being affected by this purple. Now, the thing about bounce light is they are never as bright as the local color. And they're never as dark as the turning shadow, typically, unless there's circumstances I don't know about. So what we've got a gun for is, I'm just going to take the shortcut here. I'm going to use the green of the, the green from the local color, and I'm going to mix it with the purple to mute it, because optically, the purple would mix with the green, it would mute. This is gonna make that bleed, but that's okay. I'm gonna wet that surface because I don't want a hard edge. And actually, I'm gonna turn it this way so I can paint like so. And let's see how I did. Now keep in mind, this color that I'm using is also optically mixing with the color beneath it, which is definitely influencing it quite a bit. If I wanted it to be a little bit more purple, I could fudge it. I mean, I could almost take the, the purple almost straight and use it like that, but it's, I think that's just like a little bit too, I don't know, a little bit too intense. But also keep in mind that the colors change a little bit when they dry. So I think some of that intensity is going to go away. Anyways, uh, I think that'll be it for tonight. I'll, you know, I don't think I need to paint that cast shadow on the floor. What I really wanted to do is explain to you the most common methods, tools, and techniques that I use for most of my paintings and my illustration work. And um, a lot of this knowledge actually carries straight over into my digital work, into Photoshop, because the theories are still applicable you know, the tool has changed, the brushes behave differently in a similar fashion, but not the same. But the theory behind all of it is identical, as far as I can tell. <laughs> so, anyways, um, listen everybody, thank you for joining in to another session of uh, Magic, Creato, Magic Rhino Creative uh, on, uh, on Facebook Live. Once again, you can find me on the internet, URLs are in the description. Thanks everybody, take care.